And I've chosen this reading because I'm sure that you know Ansel Adams' work, um, the, you know, pictures of Yosemite and whatnot. Um, and so it was easier to sort of talk about um, um, a character uh, whose who's, uh, uh, you know, who's life and his, and his work kind of work together. <coughs> the whole person is the person who does the, the creates the work. And by the way, I've brought two pieces of my own uh, here today, this one and that one there, um, for you to look at in, your, in time. There's um, about 50 years between this picture and that one in terms of, um, in terms of time. Which was first? This one. So I want to read to you a little bit about Ansel Adams' life because um, that, um, as I was indicating, there is a continuity, a piece of continuity between the artist, the work, and the viewer that uh, we often miss. There were conflicts of time and energy, of course, between being an artist and a public activist for conservation. And the book, uh, the autobiography, his um, autobiography, rec recounts the sense he occasionally had of the cost to his art of his conservation work. The problem was at root that though the two roles looked the same, they weren't. Making successful photographs of nature accomplished little directly to save it. Art is not didactic, as he knew. I never, as he knew, and this is a quote. I never intentionally made a creative photograph that related directly to an environmental issue. And his greatest pictures, though thrilling, ultimately induced tranquility, not a useful emotion for reformers. <laughs> Despite the necessity for Adams of pursuing several different activities, there was a unifying force behind his entire life. As Auden uh, observed of Wordsworth, that he early in life had an intense series of experiences about inanimate nature, which he spent the rest of his poetical life trying to describe. So it can be said of Adams that the experiences he had as a young man in the Sierra uh, the importance of those early encounters with nature is remembered and reconstructed in a lifetime of photography and cited again and again in his promotion of conservation. And it troubles us because his was a passion beyond what we can feel now for places like the national parks. Even though they look quite the same, his feeling for such reserves originated in the assumption of vast undamaged spaces around the parks, without which the parks seem almost trivial, a collection of eccentricities rather than emblems of the land. There was a unity in most of Adam's artistic practice too, though he began in a soft focus pictorial mode by the time he decided to be a professional photographer he spent his early years studying piano. He was close to having developed the style that remained his for the majority of his life, one employing sharp focus and long tonal range of grays. Photographs in the book, which were edited after his death, include some early and late views that employ an uncharacteristically short scale of grays, blah, blah, blah. My vision established his, its own groove, he said, as I, and, and I, as I know I have been derivative of myself. I know I have been derivative of myself for 50 years. Uh, this, if you're interested in photography um, at all, this is a great book. Robert Adams, um, no relation to Ansel Adams. Robert Adams um, is a wonderful photographer and a wonderful writer uh, and pr um, critic uh, uh, of photography. This is a great book. So I should start out this morning by noting that talking about pictures is on its face an absurd task. Pictures are more than able to speak for themselves without making any noise at all. 
and they generally suffer from being explained. Cinema is the exception that proves the rule, but we'll save the movies for another day. What I want to talk about are not particular pictures that would be silly, but the work of looking at pictures, and something about the work of making pictures, stuff I've been doing uh, one way or another all my life. Specifically, I want to end up uh, making, I want to end up talking about making and looking at photographs in particular, because in many ways that's a different matter altogether. People make pictures and often put them up on walls to look at. Once upon a time, you know, we just painted directly on the wall beautiful gestural sketches in red ochre, bison, and elk, and horses, and woolly mammoths. Images which lifted experience out of the immediate rush of life and into the still and quiet repose of contemplation. Pictures never talk back. They just are what they are. You can look at them or not. They don't care. Which brings me to the most important thing to know about pictures in general. They don't come out of the blue. They represent, represent nature, but they are not part of nature. They are, if you will, encrypted interpretations of nature the artist makes which contain clues which contain clues to unlock and decrypt the viewer's own experience. To do that, the clues must be commonly understood. The clues must be commonly understood. The artist, the art, think artifice, think artificial. And the viewer, the artist, the art, and the viewer stand in a relationship sustained by the picture itself over time. Sometimes, as in the case of the cave paintings that I, I alluded to, over dozens of thousands of years. One writer who was among those who opened the Chauvet Cave in southwestern France related the shock of seeing images of hands, dozens of them, on the walls of the cave. They had been made by blowing pigment through a straw, like spray paint, using the hand itself as a stencil. The technique used to make the image, because it was so obvious and familiar brought the viewer and the artist into direct relationship, though the artist had been dead for over 30,000 years. In our time, Jackson Pollock's so-called action paintings of the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, action paintings have the same effect. It took the New Yorker magazine 20 years of satirical cartoons to get the public to see the man dancing on the canvas, dripping festoons of paint and sloshes of drippy house paint to make images that spoke to humanity. The man, the work, the... the, the the viewer. Mm -hmm. Seamless. So it's worth talking, thinking of a picture as a token, an expression, an invitation into relationship with the artist through the medium of this cool, quiet, patient, serene thing this created object of art, that
that didn't exist before, the artist led it into the world. It's a gateway, it's a doorway. But the image has to be accepted as such. As an art product, it needs to be accepted as an art product to be noticed at all. To make sure this happens, the artist relies as much on social convention as she does on paint and paper. Here's a few examples. Pictures are mostly rectangular. Seldom square, almost never round. That's a clue. If the rectangle is vertical, you're probably looking at a figure. If the red rectangle is horizontal, with the image running from side to side, you're probably looking at a landscape. With the image, uh, you're probably looking at an ex a landscape, except that is in West Virginia, where it's the landscape that goes up and down, <laughs> and the politicians that go side to side. <laughs> Even in the generally horizontal word of computing, the orientation of a rectangular area is referred to as either landscape or portrait. We're still working with this social convention of the, you know, the orientation of a rectangle. We're still working that, still working that theme. Even more basic, since we've stopped painting right on the wall, by and large, we now expect the subject of a painting to be in the center or artfully deployed about the center of the picture plane. There is no center, really, on a wall. Here's another. The cave paintings I've been talking about use outline to describe, or more properly inscribe, on a flattish wall, rock wall, on a flattish surface, the three-dimensional <laughs> forms of living, breathing animals. But there are no outlines around things in nature. We make them up. We make them up. The artists at the Chauvet Cave made them up. They created a social convention which we continue to use to understand, uh, in a comic book way, uh, to distinguish figure and ground, subject and object. Where would coloring books be without outlines? One more. We know that people don't really get smaller as they walk away from us down the street, and then magically regain their original scale when next we see them. Similarly, we know that the upper floors of tall buildings are not teeny tiny boxes. That vertical lines are just that, vertical. They do not converge. The top floor of the Empire State Building is just as plumb and square as the street floor is. Yet we have adopted a conventional way of representing forms in space called linear perspective that has horizontal lines that converge at the horizon and vertical lines which converge up there somewhere in heaven. Actually, a Florentine painter named Masaccio developed this convention in the 15th century the better to describe the relative location and mass of the human figure in space and to create the illusion of three-dimensional space just on a flat surface. You can get 
Um, one of the things that I do all the time is I take, I, I keep my glasses on, but I close one eye. And you can flatten space and sort of eliminate that sort of binocular effect. So early painters tried to um, include that binocular effect artificially in paintings, but they didn't figure it out until the 15th century. Linear perspective is a social convention, a descriptive tool, but Masaccio, as I said, totally made it up. People became accustomed to seeing figures surrounded by space as opposed to their being ranged airlessly up against each other. Linear perspective provided a new way of seeing, a new convention, but likely not one that the cave painters of Lascaux or Chauvet would have understood at all. So the clues that the artist puts into her picture to help the viewer decrypt it have to be understood in common at some level by both the artist and the viewer. Or the pictures won't work. Artists like Masaccio and Pollock have been messing with conventional understandings like these to make images speak through the visual clutter that bombards us all the time. Most of the clutter these days is photographic, mostly not standing still, but rushing past us at a pretty good clip. Film, for example, moves through a movie camera uh, projector at something upwards of 18 feet per second to create a moving image that doesn't flicker. 18 feet a second. So when Marshall McLuhan famously declared that the medium is the message, this is what he was talking about. It is the delivery system. It's the delivery system that conveys the message, not the message itself. And that's what's important. Make the pictures move. Change up the conventions of seeing, and you have delivered an entirely revolutionary message. We're getting ready here to talk about me and the retrograde craft of photography. But first we have to contextualize a little, understand the social context, decode the conventions to get why I find photography to be so compelling. It may not surprise you, because I've probably told you already, that I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, five blocks down Benefit Street from the Rhode Island School of Design, where I went to Saturday morning art classes for years and years. My mother and her mother, my grandmother, were both photographers. The apartment I grew up in on Benefit Street had my mother's portrait studio with its huge lumbering camera in our front room, and the dark room where the magic happened in the basement. All right, right next to the washing machine. My mother took the pictures, and my father was the tinkerer who kept everything working. This was back in the gadget days of photography, when a little chemistry, some black tape, a few light bulbs, and a little kitchen ladder seemed uh, to answer every operational exigency. I read Marshall McLuhan as a teenager. When he wrote, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is an hallucinating idiot, for he sees what no one else does, things that to everyone else are not there. McLuhan seemed to be talking right to me. I was the one-eyed idiot, the fool on the hill, even as a teenager. Um, and the camera was my eye, my way of seeing what others could not or would not see. When McLuhan, was McLuhan referencing Plato's cave or St. Paul's notion of seeing through a glass darkly? I didn't know at the time. 
probably. All I knew was that the camera gave me X-ray vision. Photography for me is a disposition of the mind, a deliberate effort to seek out hidden things and document them by taking pictures. But here's the deal. It was, still is, a little like photographing ghosts. The subject of the picture, what the picture is quote unquote about, may not always be in the frame. Fast forward. After I had my little stroke two years ago, and it was a little stroke, it was over in 20 minutes. Uh, when I won, uh, in those tremulous couple of weeks afterwards, when I wandered around the house wondering every second when the other shoe was going to fall, when the big one was going to hit me, I got my digital camera out and took pictures of walls. Light falling over them, texture of paint, doorways, the corners of rooms I especially liked. Here. Just the light and the colors and the vague texture of paint and encroaching shadows. Not much else. I did a self-portrait. That was a picture of my shadow on a wall in a relatively dark room. You tell me what I was photographing. Context is everything. Painters do something entirely different. If they don't like the shape of a branch or a nose, they just change it. Photographers had to find their pictures. Out there. Good pictures don't just jump into the frame like a perky daisy or a sunset. Pictures have to be found or found out, discovered. Reality, or what passes for reality, is shy. Most of what we see blinds us to what is really going on. Still a kid, really, before I went to college. Well, I still lived near the School of Design on Benefit Street. I had lots of friends who were students there. That allowed me to blend in with the student population and use facilities like the big dark rooms, to process film. I recognized some of the professors there, went to parties with a number of them. Occasionally, maybe half a dozen times, I sat in on crits, sessions when students presented their work to the class for their critique, and often the laconic, even grunted affirmations of their teachers. Sometimes that's all you get. One such teacher whose work inspired me then and continues to inform my own vision today was Harry Callahan. Harry was just about my mother's age. He died in 1999. Here's what he said about teaching photography. I really didn't have much to teach. I didn't even believe in it. I felt so strongly that everybody had to find their own way, and nobody can teach you your way. In terms of art, the only real answer that I know of is to do it. If you don't do it, you really don't know what might happen. So that's what I did. I found my own way. And I still don't know what might happen. So may it be.
Um, 